battle you're fighting is not just about you, it's about the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. So warrior, pick up your weapons, dust your prayer mats, wipe your tears, take your stand and begin a fight, begin a contend, begin to speak the word. Do not be silent. There is a level of intensity. That is why this is called prayer storm, no prayer chill, no prayer soak. This is a prayer storm. A storm disrupts everything. Father, we thank you for what you're doing in this place. We thank you for um, the spirit of grace and supplication that you're pouring out. Father, we thank you for the spirit of wisdom and revelation that you want to release even more upon us as intercessors in this place or as ones that you want to recruit into your intercessory force. And so, Lord, as we go into your word tonight, we pray that you bring clarity, that you bring uh, just precision, uh, that your word will be like fire uh, that sets our hearts ablaze. Every discouraged, wounded warrior would be awakened with fresh grace tonight in this place. Anyone bound will be set free, God, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, we're going to be reading from uh, 1 Samuel. So if you've got your Bibles, please do turn to 1 Samuel. Um, as I was praying and seeking the Lord for this meeting, uh, this was the... The scripture the Lord put on my heart to, to teach on, to preach on uh, tonight. First Samuel chapter 1 verse 1. We're going to read a few verses. I'm reading from the uh, New King James. Now there was a certain man of Ramathiam Zophim. I don't know if I'm pronouncing these names right. So forgive me if you're Hebrew and I'm saying it wrong. <laughs> uh, Lord help us. Okay, there was a certain man of Ramathiam Zophim of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Joraham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zoph, an Ephraimite. And he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. This man went up from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Also the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. I want to just note those words there. Although the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed the womb. There's that again. So it was year after year that when she went up to the house of the Lord that her rival provoked her. Penina provoked her. Therefore, she wept and did not eat. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is it your heart is grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord. I want to note those words, she was in bitterness of soul. And she prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you would indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. We're going to keep reading. We're going to stop shortly. And it happened as she was praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. Now Eli spoke, sorry, now Hannah spoke in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. 
Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, how long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered and said, no, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but I've poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief I have spoken unto now. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant you petition which you have asked of him. Amen. Powerful passage. So many things to um, highlight in that passage. And by God's grace, we're going to journey as the Holy Spirit leads us. Um, I believe we're in a day and age where God is looking for certain types of people. And he's raising an army and he's looking for people to recruit to be part of that army. And when you say yes or when we say yes, we don't just become ordinary, we become a VIP. When I say VIP, we think of, in the natural, very important person or very important personality. But heaven has a different definition of the word VIP. It's a voice of intercession and prayer. So the title of this message is God's VIPs. And this story right here is captured for us to understand how God fashions intercessors. There are many stories in the Bible and they're incredible things and there's some stories where you don't see a lot of backstory. For example, you don't see a lot about Elijah. You don't read about how Elijah was conceived. You don't read about where Elijah came from. And you look through the Bible, you see that certain characters, you don't know a lot about them. But then when you start Samuel, the book of Samuel, and it goes into this detail about the journey of a prophet being born, there are lots of things the Lord wants us to understand in this passage. And so we're going to start to take things bit by bit. So Elkanah is actually a Levite. Now in this verse, it says that uh, he's an Ephraimite, but that's because he lived in the region of the, you know, of Ephraim. So he's a Levite that lives in the region of Ephraim. Um, and we see that in uh, 1 Chronicles 6. It gives us a bit of detail about the fact that Elkanah, this man, was a Levite. Now, Ephraim, the place he lived, is called fruitful. The meaning of Ephraim is fruitful, fertile, and productive. Are you hearing me? So this is a man, he lived in a place called fruitful. The meaning of his first wife, Hannah, is God has favored me. And then according to the dictionary of first names, Hannah means God has favored me with child. Elkanah lived in a fruitful place and his wife was called God has favored me, yet there was nothing to show for it. Being embarrassed and impatient about not having a child with Hannah, he takes matters into his own hands. Because you would understand that in that culture, having children, even now for many people, having children is such a big deal. And if you don't have a child, it's like an embarrassment. So Elkanah uh, 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 marries Hannah, believing God that the natural things will happen, they will have children. And obviously, they didn't have children. And so he did what Abraham did. It took the matters into his own hands because of his impatience. And whenever you get impatient with God, you often will birth an Ishmael. He did not have any idea of the fact that God was working something in his life. And I'm convinced of the two of them, Hannah was the prophetic one. Because you don't read much about what Hannah said or much about who he was. But when you read later, see, there's so many things that are captured in Scripture. All the things that be captured, read Hannah's prayers. You realize how prophetic she was. So really, I wonder whether what ended up happening with her in Samuel, because there's like a prophetic lineage that 
opened up with her, or maybe with her mother, or who knows. But somehow, it was compounded and manifested in the life of the child she was going to have. So he kind of over here is not discerning what's going on. He takes matters into, matters into his own hands. And he marries Penina. So he marries Penina and she starts to have children. Because she starts to have children, his desire was to have children. Because she starts to have children, he receives his breakthrough. Are you, are you with me? <laughs> He receives his breakthrough and settles. She has not got the breakthrough, but what she's actually going to give birth to is going to change the whole nation. So he received his breakthrough and settled. And this is dangerous because sometimes we can be chasing breakthroughs and not chasing God. So if breakthrough becomes your God, then when you receive it, you forget the one who gave it. Because your goal was always just to, see, there are many people, maybe some of you may even be here right now, you're going through difficult circumstances. It's not that God doesn't care about what you're going through, but he said, seek first. So regardless of the circumstance, regardless of the intensity and the pressure, he's actually wanting to be first priority. And there's sometimes when the devil can give you breakthrough because he knows that it will get you to settle. And your hunger and your pursuit is shut down. The devil is scared of your hunger. He's scared of your pursuit. Many people are chasing comfort. But as I've journeyed with God, I've realized God sometimes can let you have comfort, but he often likes to put you in positions of discomfort that causes, to re that causes you to realize your weaknesses so you lean on him more. So your leaning on him is a sign of your awareness of the fact that you can't do this without him. And so that leads you to seek him. So you pray because you need him. So your prayer is a sign of your dependence on God. And your lack of prayer is a sign of your independence of God. Your prayerlessness is a sign of your pride. So Penina now has sons and daughters. It's because she has sons and daughters, so that means she had at least two boys and two girls, at least. While well, Hannah has none. Elkanah is happy, and therefore he settles even though he is yet to birth the ambassador, the greatest ambassador of his clan. He's yet to birth the greatest thing that's going to come out of his loins, but now he's chilled. And I find it interesting now that, you know, Hannah is having all these, sorry, Penina is having all these children. And because she's having these children, uh, she has fruits or, you know, a manifestation of something that now she finds her identity in and she uses it to provoke Hannah. So it's clear Penina was not a prayer warrior because she had what she wanted. It's clear Hannah was a prayer warrior and even minus this whole breakthrough it's clear she had a heart for God, if you read her prayer. So, now you have two wives. One with lots to show for their, connected, for their connection to the bridegroom. The other wife does not have anything to show for their connection to the bridegroom. Are you with me? You know what that reminds me of? Matthew 25. The wise virgins and the foolish virgins. It says that the wise virgins took their oil and then they took their lamp. The foolish virgins, you know what they did? They took their lamp and then they took their oil. 
It's not that the oil was not important. It was just that the lamp was what, was what they were more concerned about. And what does the scripture say? Let your light so shine before men. Are you with me? So the lamp is a picture of what is seen. Are, are you with me? So they were more concerned about what is seen than the oil which is hidden. The wise ones were more concerned about the oil. And so because they invested the energy in the oil, their focus was not on how much they were seen or what they were doing, how much it was seen or not. Because their priority was the oil. And you know, the, the provoking of Penina uh, with Hannah kind of reminds me of this shift or this contention between these two um, uh, groups, the wise virgins and the foolish virgins. What was being built in Hannah was oil. Are you hearing me? <laughs> Her intercessory capacity was being expanded by the circumstance God put her in. Remember we read, the Lord closed her womb. Did you hear me? It didn't say a demon closed her womb. It didn't say the devil closed the womb. It says what? The Lord closed her womb. So the Lord had something to do with what was going on here. And when you're going through a situation and you are confused, one of the questions you need to ask is, Lord, what is behind this? Is this the enemy? Or is this you? Because some people think if it's God, it always has to be positive. <laughs> are you hearing me? Some people think God has nothing to do with negativity. But that's not always the case. Not everything positive is from God. And not everything negative is from the devil. I'll say that again. Not everything positive is from God. And not everything negative is from the devil. We think God is always doing positive things. And if something happens to us that seem, is seemingly negative, it is always from the devil. Not necessarily so. Why don't you ask Saul on the road to Damascus? Who made him blind for three days? Why don't you ask Ananias and Sapphira if they made it to heaven? Who killed them? Why don't you ask Jezebel in the book of Revelation who will put her in a sick bed if she does not repent? Why don't you ask the guy called Bar Jesus, who Paul spoke to and made blind? My question is, there's some things God does that's not always positive looking. And if we're buying to a mindset about who Jesus is, that's this kind of chill Jesus that would never tell anyone off, that's very calm, cool, collected, always gentle. We don't understand that he's also fierce. He's also a consuming fire. And he should not be messed with. I don't know what's going on with the 21st century church. And we have a, vi a, a version of Jesus that's meek. There's a song that talks about, you know, he's not a baby in the manger anymore. He's not a broken man on the cross. He didn't stay in the grave. And he's not staying in heaven forever. He's coming with a host surrounding him. And many will flee from his presence, shaken in fear. I'm telling you, we need to have a fresh vision of this Jesus. And so there's some things Jesus does that is not seemingly positive when we look at it with the human eye. But when we see it with divine revelation, we understand that there are deeper things going on that are beneficial for our longevity, our maturity, and our impact. And God is more concerned about our maturing, our being like him, than it is about our comfort. And so there are times when he allows certain things to happen because he's in the business of fashioning us. Hannah was building capacity. She was investing in oil. 
She may not have seen it that way, but heaven was seeing it that way. Because for heaven to release what heaven was pregnant with, it couldn't just release it into any common random womb. Her years of crying out was actually preparing the chamber for the voice that would shape the whole nation. The voice that will shake generations. Because because of Samuel, we have David. Are you, are you hearing me? She had no idea the weightiness of the destiny that she was going to give birth to. Some of you need to look at yourself and say, Lord, my womb is not a graveyard. My womb, and that's, by the way, it's not just women that have wombs. Women have wombs in the physical, which speaks of a lot of things that they're called to do uh, in the natural, but men also have wombs in the spirit. It's just like you're a female son of God. Son of God is not like, are you women? You don't see daughter of God in scripture because it's a position in scripture. So as a female, you're a female son of God. Are, are you hearing me? In the same way, spiritually you can have a womb, but for some people their wombs are like chambers for death to take place because they're not investing and building that space to host life. And I know this could be a touchy subject, but as I was praying even for this meeting, I believe the Lord wants to reverse the curse of miscarriage. There's a few people here where that has been your story. And you need to place your hand on your womb and say, this is not a graveyard anymore. This is a chamber to birth whatever the Lord wants to place in this place and begin to pray violently, consistently, because you're preparing the space for whatever the Lord wants to release. Wipe your tears, arise, woman of God, and know that you're called to give birth to something of significance. Don't give up the fight. Don't back down. Oh, well, Lord, you've done it for everyone else. I guess not for me. No, 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 no. Keep speaking it over your womb. Penina had many children, but we generally don't tend to know any of their names. Can you name any of Penina's children to me? No? Even though they all had the same father as Samuel. You know why? No one remembers what comes easy. We want the easy way. We want the cheap way. But God often likes to take us through the process, the making. He's more in the making of you than you just arriving at the destination. While you're praying, you just want to get to the destination, but he wants to make you. So that when you get to the destination, you don't lose the position because you were not prepared for that place. The journey prepares you for the destination. And listen, people, the journey is not always fun. In verse 5, it says, although the Lord closed the womb. Another translation says, the Lord had given her no child. So now Hannah has a problem. And it's a theological problem. Because according to Deuteronomy 7, 11, listen to what the scripture says. And I believe this is Moses speaking. Therefore, take care to follow the commands and the decrees and the laws I give you. So the Lord is speaking to the people of Israel, rather, through Moses. Deuteronomy 7, 11. Therefore, take it to follow the commands and the decrees and the laws I give you today. Verse 12. If you pay attention to these laws and are careful to follow them, then the Lord uh, will keep his covenant of love with you as he swore to your ancestors. Verse 14. You will be blessed more than any other people. And then listen to this. The Lord said, none of your men or women will be childless, nor will any of your livestock be without young. 
The condition for this word was, if you follow our, my commands, the Lord says, if you keep my decrees I'm giving to you this day, none of your, what's it, men or women will be childless. The Lord said that. And based on my understanding, even looking through scripture, Hannah was righteous. In fact, if that's debatable, how about we consider Elizabeth? The Bible specifically says Elizabeth was righteous. How is it that they were righteous, fulfilling God's promises and God's commands rather, and yet what God said he would do, he's not doing? How many realize there's now a tension therein? Lord, you said, but it's not happening. So you have the opportunity to always get offended at God. And God would often offend your flesh to reveal your heart. When you get to a place where it seems like God has said, and you're doing what you know to do, and it's not happening, it's not the time to complain. It's actually the time to begin a partner with the spirit of grace and supplication, which will eventually give birth to revelation, to help you to understand the position you're in and appreciate the season you're in and what God is doing. In situations where our lives seem like a contradiction to what the Lord has said, there's often a deeper mystery at work. When everything seems to be what God has said, but somehow it's not happening, there's another mystery at work. And we need to partner with the Holy Spirit so that the word of the Lord will come fully into fruition. I find it fascinating as well. Abraham was a righteous man. Yeah, look at the delay. <laughs> it's interesting that God puts some of his, let me say it this way. It seems to me that God forges his greatest intercessors in the crucible of afflictions and pain. Anyone going through afflictions and pain in this room? <laughs> Online. It seems to me that God uses these circumstances to forge some of his greatest intercessors. So now you have Hannah. Her name is favored by God. She lived in a place called Fruitful. God gave her a name that was a contradiction to a current situation. This led to a personal frustration, which was divine orchestration to produce desperation to shift her into a next dimension. I'm going to say that again, and I had to write it down, because that sounds good. <laughs> Hannah was named favored by God, and she lived in a place called Fruitful. God gave her a name that was a direct contradiction to her current situation. This led to a personal frustration, which was divine orchestration to produce desperation to shift her into a next dimension. The Lord has a way of orchestrating our lives. And what I'm trying to communicate to you is, Hannah did not know that she was on God's VIP list. She had no idea that heaven had taken note of her. Heaven had studied her lineage and the giftings in that lineage and what could come out of that lineage. And heaven had almost caused her to marry this man, Elkanah. And heaven was behind everything going on because Heaven was desperate to release something weighty into the earth. Have you ever had something that means a lot to you? Maybe you spend a lot of money to buy some expensive, I don't know, car or equipment, if you're into technology. Imagine you spent a lot of money, like more money than you've ever spent. And someone comes, that's your friend, and just asks you, can I borrow it? 
Can anyone appreciate the situation? <laughs> if you spend 10,000 pounds to buy a device, and for you that's like the most expensive thing you've ever bought, and a friend comes that doesn't understand that device like you do, and comes and says to you, can I borrow it? You're probably gonna think twice before answering. Why? Because you're not convinced they value it the way you do. Because you're not convinced they value it the way you do, there's gonna be hesitation in your heart to release it to them. Now, you see, this is really interesting because God is wanting to find people on the earth that values what he's about to release the way he values it. That's why you read this passage in um, uh, Isaiah, Isaiah 62. For Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. The Lord's saying this. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and as salvation as a lamp. So that's the Lord saying, I will not hold my peace. But then look at what he says in verse 6. I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem, and they shall never hold their peace. Are you hearing me? So the Lord chooses not to hold his peace, but is looking for a mirror of that passion on the earth. So he says, I have now set people on the earth who would also not hold their peace. Because he's warning people that are reflecting his passion on the earth. So now heaven is pregnant with something as significant as Samuel. And heaven is looking for a womb that will value it the way heaven values it. Because the whole of the history of Israel is about to shift. But what womb in the whole of Israel can value this child the way heaven values it? So heaven orchestrates a situation that will cause an individual to begin to mirror the cry of heaven. She was in bitterness. She was crying. Heaven is like, are, earth, are you ready for this? Are you ready? Who is going to value this weighty prophet like we do? So the situation was orchestrated. Hannah was praying for a child and heaven was pregnant with a prophet. Hannah was just thinking about now, but heaven was thinking about generations and the Messiah. <laughs> Hannah did not have the vision for the Messiah and David and Samuel and the lineage. She had no idea. So because of the weightiness of what was at stake, Heaven could not just drop it in any common family or in any common womb. That womb had to be a womb that carried the desperation. So heaven was actually waiting for that sound to come from Anna. It's like a frequency that then unlocks. It's like, are you with me? It's like there's a sound, there's a desperation. How many have children here? Children scream all the time, they shout. But I mean, no. They, they shout and scream. That's what children do. They run around and scream. But how many knows there's a certain scream? When you hear it, it's a different frequency and it hits different. Shall I give you an example? One day I came home. I was downstairs with children. My wife was somewhere. And um, they were upstairs doing something, playing. Next thing I heard that kind of scream. I was on the phone, I just ran scared upstairs, wondering what's happened. I go upstairs and one of our children, her finger was trapped in the door. So when I took her, in fact, but sorry to get very graphic. When, I, when, the, when the door got open, I was wondering if the fingers were still going to be there. It was that bad. So I just, when, when I took her, she was just weeping, and I was just weeping as well. Like, oh, God, oh, God. <laughs> I'm like, what do I call? What do I call? What do I do? <laughs> so I heard, by the way, her finger was, ended up being okay. So the, the, the point of the story is I heard that scream. 
and it was a deathly scream. And I knew this is different. Are you with me? Desperation has a frequency, a sound to it. Some of you are putting on a show. You've not stepped into the desperation of the moment. Listen to what Hannah said. She poured out her soul to the Lord. The VIPs God is wanting to raise up, the voices of intercession and prayer, are people that know how to engage their whole soul in the art of prayer. See, because she has stepped into that realm, it means she stepped into that realm and she had a breakthrough. It means she can go back to that realm whenever the situation demands that she steps into that place. Because locked in her memory was the, how she poured out her soul. So a few years down the line, the Holy Spirit can come on her and say, you remember how you prayed back then? I'm pulling that again now because that's what this situation demands. This, you know, some of you are praying very casual tongues. The tongues that makes the demons comfortable around you. No, no, yeah, no, no, no. No, 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 no. The demon is just sitting, chilling out. Because, and I say this to my son as well, because we pray together often. I'm like, Justice, you're not in the prayer. You're not here. Wake up. Where are you? Get in the prayer. Sorry, Daddy, sorry, Daddy. Get in the prayer. <laughs> Justice, we're at war. Oh, James, you've been too hard. No, I'm not being too hard. I know we're at war. How can I be traveling the nations, dealing with demons, and not train my children to be warriors? Because when those demons try to trace where I've come from, and they go to my home, they have to find warrior children praying in the spirit. Katavalaka monastas, Ivalayas, Esastunamandas. We have to raise up warring children. I'm not going to take prayer casually with my children, no. Driving to school, we're praying fervently. I don't care if there is no crisis. Show me the Christian that knows how to pray fervently without crisis, and I'll show you the Christian that's rightly aligned to handle the crisis when it arises. Don't wait for a crisis moment. Oh, someone has got cancer. Train them in the art of fervency. Your tongues are lazy. Your tongues are lazy. Wake up, warrior. Catalina Vando Hasinas. Ibala Nahatulasas. Are you with me? I'm putting my soul in my sound. If the prayer doesn't move you, why should heaven be bothered? You're half asleep. You're not bothered. You're taking the situation lightly. And yeah, you think heaven will take your prayer lightly? You think heaven will take your prayer seriously? No. There is a level of intensity. That is why this is called prayer storm. Not prayer chill. Not prayer soak. This is a prayer storm. A storm disrupts everything. A storm cannot go through a place and it looks the same. But you've lived in the same neighborhood for 10, 20 years and it looks the same. Could it be that you've not stepped into an aspect of contending prayer? Part of the assignment on this movement is to raise up warriors that would know how to contend. Contend. I remember some time ago, my pastor and one other a friend of ours, Josh, they went to a, a revival out poor in America, Asbury Revival. And have you heard about it? Thousands of people were gathered from all around the world. And when they came back to church on a Sunday, they shared about this. And it was great. And in fact, one of the key things they shared about was the spirit of travail, the prayer. Spirit of travail. And so they talked about travailing prayer. This is how we travail. And they were so stirred. And so they finished and they said to the whole church, let's pray. And so everyone got up. I got up to, I was in the front. I'm ready to do what I've just said. 
pour out my soul. But I look around and people are praying like this. Oh, Lord, I just received your love. <laughs> Thank you, Holy Spirit. So I, I think if I'm not mistaken, I went to Pastor Joe. I said, Pastor Joe, can I say something? <laughs> it's like, yeah. I'm like, guys, this is not how you contend. Oh, Lord, thank you for your love. Oh, I just rest in you right now. I'm not saying that is wrong. That has its place. Hannah was not resting in the love of God. Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane was not resting in the love of God. Elijah on the mountaintop praying for rain was not resting and soaking. What was he doing? Pouring out his soul. I'm not saying they didn't know God loved them. That was the foundation. We're not praying to earn his love. We're praying from his love. Thank God for the songs about the love of God. But I also want the songs about war. About contending. Too many Christians are soaking when they should be contending. You don't contend like this. This is a posture to receive. There's a place to receive. But when you're like Hannah, you are, even though God gave her and she received, but really the process of her receiving had to be littered with her contending anguish, crying out prayers. Those are not soaky prayers. So oftentimes when I go to prayer meetings and I see people have stepped into their soaky mode, if I know the leader of the prayer meeting and I have a good relationship and I say, hey, is it okay if I say something? <laughs> this is not a soaky moment. I had my quiet time at home. This is not my quiet time. And even at home, my time was not always quiet. But there were some quiet moments too, because I do believe in waiting on the Lord in silence. There's a time for that too. But I believe because of what we're facing in this generation, God is wanting to raise up VIPs that understand the art of contending prayer. Hey! Ay, 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 ay! VIPs, arise! The law of divine restriction. Why did God let Hannah go through this? Divine restriction can be seen in the hose pipe. You put the hose pipe in, plug into the tap, water flows. But if you want that water to go further, you apply something to the hose pipe, your thumb. To restrict the flow so that the water goes the law of divine restriction. The times when God wants your life to go further. He wants you to have a greater impact because before you enter your mother's womb, you were in his womb and he knew you. He knew what you were capable of. And then you came to the earth, but you're not seeking him. But now the devil somehow has picked up on what you're capable of. So the devil has an idea and God knows what you're capable of. And you're the only one that's ignorant in the middle. And there's a battle raging, but you're ignorant of what you're carrying. And so you're complaining about the circumstance that was orchestrated to cause you to go further. Instead of building your capacity in the spirit, you're looking at everybody else. Oh Lord, they had a child very quick. Oh Lord, their marriage happened so quick. Oh Lord, that breakthrough came for that guy so quick. Why am I struggling? Because you're in the, is training your hands for war and your fingers for battle. And be careful about comparing yourself to people. Because I am a third generation preacher. So I can't do what I'm doing if my father and my father's father did not do some things. And for many of us Africans who have ancestry of idolatry, there's a lot of spiritual warfare that needs to happen to untangle ourselves from those identities and from those covenants before we can stand afresh. So think of two people. 
I have two people and I give them both two million pounds to build a house. And for one person, I gave them a land that's prepared. And for the other person, I gave them a swampy land that's full of water. They both have the same amount, right? The one that has a land that's prepared would go a lot further quickly with the two million. The one that has the land that's not prepared would spend a lot of that money first. What? Preparing the land. So you over here, you don't realize there's a lot of stuff in your ancestry that you need to undo. And you're like, but Lord, I'm doing my two hours prayer, but I'm not seeing the result. It's because you're still trying to get rid of the lot of war, the, the waterlogged land. The other guy, he's, he's doing his hour, he's in, he's, in fact, he's not even praying much, but somehow things are just breaking up. It's because his great, great, great grandfather was a missionary who was killed, who died serving the Lord. And then the one after that served the Lord till his death. The one after that served the Lord. So, are you with me? And then he was born. Do you see the spiritual heritage he has? His starting point is different from you. Who your grandfather was the chief habilis of the village. Because your grandfather was the chief habilis of the village. By the way, do you know what that means? It means there is a priesthood in your bloodline. Because of that priesthood, you would have spiritual experiences. Like you would naturally be tuned into the Spirit. Naturally, even if you're not saved. You naturally, so there is a priesthood. Now the devil hijacked it with your great-great-grandfather for idolatry. And now you become saved. There are lots of battles you need to fight to reclaim that priesthood and make it a righteous one and set a new precedent for your children. So stop looking at the guy who's having it easy and realize the battle you're fighting is not just about you, it's about the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. So warrior, pick up your weapons, dust your prayer mats, wipe your tears, take your stand and begin a fight, begin to contend, begin to speak the word. Do not be silent. The devil is a liar. He will not be. So other women found it very easy to conceive. But when you conceive, that's when you had a weird dream. You had a dream, you were attacked by this old man who was chasing you in the dream. He punched you in the, in the stomach. You woke up and then you were bleeding and you lost the baby. All this crazy thing. It's a warfare. See, listen, warfare surrounds the birth of a miracle. When you take the path of least resistance, you never birth anything memorable. It takes an intercessor with a depth of affliction like Hannah to birth a prophet, a prophet of the magnitude of Samuel. Are you hearing me? It takes an intercessor with the affliction of the depth of what Hannah went through to birth a prophet of the magnitude of Samuel. He wasn't just going to come any, nat nat any kind of easy way. Her pain produced a prayer that produced a prophet. Some of you are wasting your pain. Some of you are wasting your pain. Your pain is ammunition. Not to allow the enemy manipulate you, but ammunition for you to run into the presence of God and let that pain be part of your feel that gets you going and seeking him. The devil wants to use you through that pain to end up in all kinds of bondage and cycles. But that same pain can lead you to a place of becoming a significant voice in the heavens. Hmm. We read of Hannah's moment of breakthrough. That moment of breakthrough was significant. That's why it's recorded here. I want to announce to you that that was not the first time Hannah ever prayed for a child. But that was the one that caused the breakthrough. You know, it's like, imagine you have a massive hammer and you're trying to smash down a wall. And you know that hammer has the ability to smash down that wall. And you stand on the first hit, second hit, 
third hit. And it may seem like nothing is happening, but the bricks are weakening. The cracks are forming. Another hit. Another hit. Are you with me? What we see recorded here is the final hit that shattered that thing. A few things I want you to notice and then we're going to pray. Hannah prayed and it was because of the provoking of the second wife. In fact, God was using the second wife. God was using the second wife to get her to a certain place. So with the natural eye, you'll say, oh, poor Hannah. But with the heavenly eye, the Lord is like, yes, she's getting there. <laughs> she's finally getting to the place where I want her prayer to come from. You know, we, we can pray. You can have three people praying the same prayer. Lord, move. Another person. Lord, move. Another person. Lord. And the, all three prayers carry different levels of weight in the spirit. They're all saying the same thing, even at the same volume. But all, Are you with me? Hannah was praying from a deep place. And in that deep place, she made a vow. The vow, she made it in her heart, but heaven heard it loud. You gotta be careful the vows you make when you're in deep anguish. Some people don't realize that even though this is a positive thing that happened for Hannah, for many people, the principle works in the reverse. In a moment of deep anguish, in the midst of a heated argument with your spouse, a heated moment, and then you release certain utterances, are you with me? <laughs> Those are powered, spirit-powered utterances. So they are not just ordinary. They go deep. And the enemy can often partner with them to increase bondage and, you know, afflictions upon people. So you got to be careful the words that come out of your mouth or even out of your heart. Some people have made vows in their hearts about men. I'm never going to trust another man again. They never said it out, but they said it in their heart. And because they said it, it registered. And that vow becomes a restriction for the rest of their life. I remember speaking to someone some time ago and praying with a guy who made a vow to someone that he was in a relationship with that wasn't his wife. And, you know, I will never leave you, you know, I would rather die than not have, you see, well, you know what I mean? And it became obvious down the road that that was in the right relationship. And now he's struggling to break the soul tie, even though he's moved on. Because you have to undo the vow. Haven't you wondered why Jesus had to restore Peter three times by him saying, I love you, I love you, I love you? Because he denied him three times. With every time he said, I love you, he was undoing. Are you with me? So in the place of deep anguish, she cried out to God. And here's where I want to finish. Something shifted in her prayer because she stopped looking at herself and she started looking at God. And so she said, Lord, if you give me this child, I will give him back to you. Meaning, I'm going to wean him to like maybe he's three or something and then I'm going to leave him in the temple. How many mothers are in the house? Can you imagine giving birth to a child after two or three years taking the child and leaving the child in the temple not to see the child again apart from every year when you go do you realize that's a weighty thing to say. What I want to show you is, she died in that moment. She died to her prayer request. Because now she said, Lord, whatever you give, even if you give it, it's not mine anymore. 
Because she died to it, a resurrection took place. The Lord is wanting to raise up VIPs in this place. Voices of intercession and prayer. Voices of intercession and prayer. Ah, yeah, here, Vestonam Balakaitos. Avalanamanda Lehastos. Hevai, Havai, Hevai, Havai. Etalanamanto Capaces. Etalanamanto Capaces. Ibalayas, Ibalayas, Ibalayas. Hale, Hale, Hale. Listen. There's some of us, you've idolized certain prayer requests. It's not that God doesn't want to answer them, but He wants your priorities to shift. Something shifted in Hannah. It's not that she didn't want a child anymore, but her whole perspective shifted. It's like she aligned with God's purpose. God wanted that child anyway. All along, she probably had never got to the point of that vow. Perhaps the situation was orchestrated for her to get to the play, place where she was actually going to give up the child. God wanted that child more than Hannah. But He wanted to pass that child through her womb. And he wanted her to give him up. And only when she died to the request did God give it to her. It's not that God didn't want her to have a child. He just wanted to shift in her. And then when you read her prayer, you realize she was truly an intercessor. Go and read 2 Samuel. Read Hannah's prayer. The articulation, the revelation, the clarity. She even spoke about a king. Israel had not yet had a king. She had prophetic insight. She was a prophetic intercessor. And so the call tonight, God is wanting to raise up VIPs. And I believe He sent me here this first night to call out those in the room and those online. Do you want to join God's VIP list? It's easy to say the yes, but the affliction and the situations and the contradictions to bring you to the next dimensions are not often easy. And many of you are going through them right now. And this is a prophetic word to you to align yourself, to realize He's expanding your womb. He's creating the space for the seed of heaven to truly come and be incubated and released into the earth. So if you're here today and you want to say yes to this call, a fresh call to be a voice of intercession and prayer, I want to invite you to come forward right now to this altar, this space, and we're going to cry out to God. I don't, I didn't mean, I didn't say we're going to do soaky prayer. We're going to cry out to God. Take that pain, take that frustration, take that situation that's a contradiction to the promises, and turn it into a cry and say, Lord, I will be an intercessor. I want to step onto your VIP list. Count me in, count me in for the sake of my family, for the sake of my community, for the sake of my nation, for the sake of this generation. Count me in, lift your voice. Oh. Evekayas, Evekayas, Evekayas. 
Keep going. Hala Jesus in Avala Kandos. Hebele na malakatula sivis. Asuto la kambala tailas. Asalas. Ilinaya malonas. Aya kotola. Epa, 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 epa. Avalana Mandos Sita Lias Haye, 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 Alarabalendos Amalayas, Amalayas, Amalayas. Hey, Jesus, Jesus. I see wombs opening up. I see wombs opening up. I see children being released from heaven. I see wombs opening up. I see tumors dissolving. Tumors dissolving in wombs. Wombs opening up. Oh! Ekechas! Ekechas! It's not too late to give birth. It's not too late to give birth. It's not too late to give birth. It's not too late to be with child. Ebelana Montulasis. Have I, have I, have I us? Listen, I know this message in many ways was like a, you know, a pictorial kind of metaphorical, but I also feel it's literal for some women in this room. Literal. As we're praying, I felt like the Lord was unlocking some wombs and children that are destined to arrive in the earth. I see a connection between heaven and wombs in this room. Who are those women in this room? Repeated miscarriages? Believing God for a child, but it seems like it's impossible? I want you to lift your hands right now, and we're gonna agree that even as we've stepped into this moment, it's not just 
a message. It's a prophetic message to you that your womb is being revived. Father, right now, you gave this message for such a time as this. Even people watching online, they are prophetic children that are yet to come into the earth. These children would usher in the second coming. These children will be key in the move of God in the earth. And heaven is looking for wombs that will carry these children, sons and daughters, coming straight from the heart of God. So Father, over every woman in this room right now, I take authority over barrenness. I take authority over unfruitfulness. And Father, let the tumors, the blockages begin to dissolve, 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 dissolve. By the fire of God. Oh! Every, every orchestration from the pit of hell, manipulations, hindering, you walking into your season of fruitfulness. We declare tonight marks a reversal, a turnaround. In the name of Jesus. And this is not just physical wombs, it's spiritual wombs. Some of you have had spiritual abortions. The Lord gave you something. He stirred something in you. But you allowed the word of man. You allowed circumstances. You allowed the voice of the enemy to kill that seed, to drown it. The Lord is wanting to revive in you the seed of His Word right now. He's calling you back to the inner chambers. He's calling you back. Oh! It's not too late to be with child in the Spirit. I'm speaking over you. It's not too late to be with child in the Spirit. For you will be with you will be with child and you will birth that which heaven wants to release in the earth. Halanayavas. Lord forgive us for spiritual abortions. Forgive us for believing the lies of the enemy. Forgive us for coming into partnership with demons and doctrines of devils. Realign our wombs again with your agenda. Draw us into your inner chambers. Oh! We will be your voices of intercession and prayer. Hasalai no sivai kataleyas. Jesus. 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 Wounded intercessors, receive your healing. Wounded intercessors, discouraged intercessors, receive courage, receive vision.
vision and faith arise ah hasanalastes hivalanamalastes Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Ghost. <laughs> Jesus. receiving fresh fire prayer altars receiving fire in Jesus name <laughs> 